You know the title of our series has spun off the Great Wall of China. I'm sure you know a little bit about the Great Wall of China. First of all, it's the world's largest wall and the biggest ancient architectural um, endeavor that ever took place on this planet. It's officially 13,170 miles long. That's half the circumference of the world. It's about 2,300 years old. And it was done to protect the northern borders from their enemies coming in. It ended up being called the largest cemetery in the earth because over one million males died in its construction. One third of it has already disappeared without a trace and that wall did not keep Genghis Khan and his armies out. But I want you to know that God has a wall and that wall is not like the Great Wall of China which is crumbling and disappearing with time. And it's, that wall was constructed for the last days of Earth's history. And so I want to invite you to bow your heads with me as we pray and we'll move right into my last part of this eight-part series. Father in heaven, what a great God you are. It's exciting to have this position only because as I speak, I see your love more clearly than I did before I spoke. And I wish everyone could experience that. But Lord, I ask you to speak through me so everyone can experience that. To see that you're a glorious, great God who has built a wall to protect us. And if we stay within its confines, not even Genghis Khan can get over, around, or through. And so bless us. Hide me behind the cross of Calvary, Lord. Let us hear your voice so that each person who has come will know it wasn't an accident, it wasn't a, co a coincidence, Lord, but instead it was a divine appointment. So meet with us now and help us to hear you, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. amen. In part one, we were introduced in Revelation, the 12th chapter, to enter the dragon. And we found out in that chapter that the dragon especially attacks us viciously in the last days of Earth's history. And then we move to chapter 13. And please notice, we're moving along according to chapters here. And in the first half of Revelation 13, we were introduced to the beast. And we discovered the beast to be the papacy or the Roman Catholic Church. And then we looked at the second half, the last half of Revelation 13, and we were introduced to a, another power called the image to the beast. And so we discovered in Revelation 12 and 13, and the Bible clarifies that there's the unholy trinity. There is the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet, the, the image to the beast in the book of Revelation, look at chapter 16, is called the false prophet because the United States of America was raised up to support the real gospel and people from Europe and England came over here to find shelter from persecution. But the Bible says... It had two horns like a lamb, but it spoke like a dragon. And then we were introduced to God's great wall. And that is the three angels' messages of Revelation 14. Notice, 12, the dragon and how he works. 13, and who are his conspirators, co-conspirators. We get to 14, we see God's answer to the unholy trinity, folks. In Revelation, it says the messages of this chapter, Revelation 14, constitute a threefold warning, which is to prepare the inhabitants of the world for the Lord's second coming. Amen. 
In other words, it is this message is a buffer for us from what is soon going to transpire because of the work of the unholy trinity. And then we looked at the second, oh, I'm moving too fast, trying to save some time. And notice the first angel's message was fear God, give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who made heaven, earth, sea and all that in them is. That's the first angel message. It's a call to the church in particular to get your act together because then the second angel's message is what we need to give to the world and that is... And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, a second angel, caused all nations to drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And we discovered the wine of Babylon, folks. The wine of Babylon, which great controversy says, were it not that the world is hopelessly intoxicated with the wine of Babylon, false doctrine, multitudes would be convicted and converted by the plain cutting truths of the word of God. Now let's stop mentally just for a second. I got to get going here, but I want you to see this. The first call is for us to wake up and worship God the way he wants to be. In the meantime, the unholy trinity is doing all they can to divert our attention from God to them and their future plans. And what they have is the wine of Babylon, it's called, which is false doctrine, which almost the whole world, except for those who are worshiping idols, have swallowed as Christians today. And then we go to the third angel's message. Enter the mark of the beast. And it says in there, then the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, if any man worship the beast in his image and receive the mark in his forehead or his hand, those who drink of the wine of Babylon, whether you did it ignorantly, intelligently, by an accident, if that doesn't stop and we go back to fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come and worship him, then we are are subject to the mark of the beast. And then in part two of the third angel's message, we discovered he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God. Not only is there a mark that the people who worship the beast or his image will receive, but they will partake of the wrath of God who remembers what the wrath of, the God, of God is? The seven last plagues. That is correct. And so we looked at that and we found out that he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God. See, you either drink the wine of the wrath of, the, of Babylon or you drink the wine of God. And if you don't drink the wine of God, it's poured out in, in full measure in the strength of his cup of indignation. He shall torment them with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels, in the presence of the Lamb. Now, just for a second, let me stop there. I want to get my act together because I get excited. Folks, you wonder where the love of God is in this, I'll tell you. He's warned us well in advance what's going to happen and how to buffer against it. And he's made it very plain what the results will be if you choose to rebel against him. In fact, you put God in a corner. We actually put him in a corner and give him no alternative. Because you see, no one who drinks the wine of Babylon willfully would be happy in heaven for eternity. That's what hell would really be for them. In fact, this burning idea for eternity isn't half as bad as you being somewhere you've never wanted to, been, you've never wanted to be. 
How many of you go to work and wish you didn't go to work? Then you know what I'm talking about. I remember I was a teacher in Chicago before I became a Seventh-day Adventist. And I remember I had a principal that they, they, gave, they said, we've seen you here as a substitute teacher. You're great. We want you to take this classroom of sixth graders in the ghettos of Chicago. And I was all excited because it'd be my own classroom. Those kids about killed me. <laughs> and every day I got in that car, and I didn't talk to God because I wasn't a Christian. I talked to myself. I don't want to go to work. I don't want to be there. I wish something else would happen. And so, Father, our Father in heaven is so merciful that he will put these people that love the wine of Babylon out of their misery, as you will see shortly. That's where the mercy and love of God is in the three angels' messages. And remember, folks, these messages go out to everybody. And they've been going out at least since 1844. And so, what about this? He shall torment them with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. In fact, it also goes on to say, and the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever and they have no rest day or night who worship the beast and his image and whoever received the mark in his name. And so part eight is enter the lake of fire. Now, in order to do it, last week, for those of you here, we did the wrath of God. Today, we're going to do the tormented with fire and brimstone. In order to do that, we're going to go back at the beginning. When Jesus returns, what? Oh, part eight. Okay. Enter the lake of fire. When Jesus returns, what will happen first? All right, I'll answer that question for you, even though you already know it. First Thessalonians says, but I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those that have fallen asleep, that you'll sorrow not even as others who have no hope. For if you believe that Jesus died and rose again, that, the, that he will come back again. And when he does, the dead in Christ shall rise first. He'll sh descend from heaven with a shout, a voice of archangel, the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds and meet the Lord in the air. When Jesus comes, the believers dead and living will return to heaven with Jesus and will shortly see for 1,000 years. But what also happens when Jesus returns? 2 Thessalonians 2, 7 says, When the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flame fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ they'll be destroyed by the presence of his coming. Remember, folks, to, to God is a perfect being. Sin can't stand in his presence. When he returns, the righteous will be resurrected and raised and, and ascend, and the wicked will die. That's what it says. Well, let's move on. In fact, Revelation gives us a clue here. It says at that very coming of Jesus, it says the kings of the earth, the great men and the rich men and the commanders and the mighty men, every slave and every free man hid themselves in caves and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the rocks and mountains, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath is come. And Hebrews 12, 29, for our God is a consuming fire. 
There it is. Now, folks, something is really wrong that when Jesus appears in the sky, the group that had rejected him drank the wine of Babylon. They, they, they try to commit suicide. Fall on us. You want a mountain to fall on you? Rocks? See, they're going berserk. They can't stand the presence of a perfect, sinless, pure God. And so Revelation tells us they're going to run and hide. And then we find out that Satan is bound for, um, is bound on this destroyed earth for a thousand years while the saints are in heaven and the wicked are dead. I'll I'll tell you, is that hell (laughs) for Satan and his angels to be all alone on this earth? Do you know that Jeremiah and including Revelation, when it talks about the millennium, really state that the earth at the second coming of Jesus will revert back to its condition before creation took place. For the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And Satan and his angels are sitting there for a thousand years with no one to tempt. He, the angel, laid hold of the dragon and the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years, folks. Say hallelujah, for you see, it is Satan that causes all our trouble. It is Satan who harasses us because it's the only way he can get back at Jesus. And the the story tells us that this angel, the dragon, will grab the dragon, the serpent of old, and, and bind him for a thousand years. He's sitting there stuck without anything to do, and that's a good punishment, I think. Number four, Revelation 27. And when the thousand years have ended, and now I go to Revelation 21.2, Then I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from heaven from God. Satan will be released from his prison. Hmm, Satan will be released from his prison. Now, folks, they ran and they said, fall on his mountains, fall on his rock, kill us. Who can stand in the presence of such holiness? And by the way, The righteous are standing there. He's here, he's here. And so I say to myself, wait a minute, if Satan is loosed at the end of the thousand years, man, if I was one of the wicked and I came back to life, I'd get on my knees and what would I say? Lord, I'm sorry. Lord, I made a big mistake. Lord, please help me. Well, what happens next? Five, Satan will go out to deceive the nations. Hello? Which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, whose number is the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. Something's wrong here. They'll never repent. Do you get that? God has to put this in here so that we can see their actions. And by their actions, we know that God doesn't make any mistakes. There's nothing that will change these people's mind, even after they lay dead for 1,000 years. And then notice what it says in Revelation verse 9. It says, and the fire come down from heaven, out uh, from God out of heaven and devoured them. Now, let's look at the word devoured. In the Greek, it's katethos, to eat up. I eat up till it is finished. From Caddo down, 
and estheo, which is eat, eat all the way down. But I'm giving you what the dictionary says is the definition of this Greek word that's translated English, devoured. Utterly devoured, leaving nothing. Ferociously consumed. Get that, ferociously consumed. All the way down, that is, with rapacious, vor voracious appetite, leaving only ruination without hope of recovery or even remains. Now, remember what we're doing. We're moving to defining what it means tormented with fire and brimstone forever and ever. Okay? But that same book, Revelation chapter 20, says they're devoured. So something isn't quite right there. In fact, take a look at this, verse 10. And the devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone. Okay, so now we know fire and brimstone is the lake of fire. Got that? From the Bible, you see that. And look at what it says, where the beast and the false prophet are. So over here we read that Satan was thrown in the lake of fire along with the false prophet. And now we find out that the beast and the false prophet are there also. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. And then death in Hades, verse 14 of chapter 20, will be thrown in the lake of fire. But I cut over to verse 15. And anyone who was not found written in the book of life were cast into the lake of fire. And this is the second death. Okay, remember what we're doing. We're looking at tormented with fire and brimstone. Let me tell you something. It is beyond my comprehension how the vast majority of Christians can think that a loving God who is so merciful would torture forever people who rejected him. In this United States of America, we are not that inhumane. In fact, when these presidents or whatever come and they're questioned by Congress or whatever, they say, will you do waterboarding? We don't believe in torture. We believe in a fair punishment that fits the crime. But all of a sudden, our God, our God is going to maintain their life through eternity and torture them the whole time. And many Christians think Satan is in charge of hell. And folks, Satan is the one that caused all this. And I'll tell you, if any of my relatives are in the lake of fire and I'm in heaven, it won't be much of a heaven for me because my mind will be where they are if it really existed. And so I'm showing you that the words of Scripture make it very plain that the punishment is forever and ever, not the punishing. Amen. And so let's look at these words. We see the word torment, the Greek word, basanizo, basanizo, to torture, pain, toil, torment. But I looked at that word in the Greek, and I found out that that word that is translated torment here comes from a Greek word, the, the main Greek word, and that main Greek word is, um, let me see if I can find it now. Uh, I can't find it. Oh, basanos. Basanizo is a verb that comes from basanos. Basanos means touchstone. Does anybody know what a touchstone is? I didn't. I looked it up on the Internet. <laughs> a touchstone is criterion, a standard, a yardstick, a benchmark, a barometer, a litmus test. That word tormented day and night comes from the Greek word that means touchstone. To me, in other words, this is what 
will be the standard for those who drink the wine of Babylon. They'll be tormented day and night forever. Now let's look at the word forever. This is a fun word too. A heon. A heon is properly an age. How long is an age? What does the Bible say? Three score and ten? And what happens after three score and ten approximately? You're dead. Yeah. That's an age. Forever and ever, the context determines whether it means eternity like heaven or on earth. In fact, 65 times this word is used, a heon, in which it's referring to something that has already ended. I'll give you a couple examples in a second. What am I doing here? I'm building the case to show you that the Bible is clearly staying. There is no hell, it's a lake of fire. And look what happens, that fire comes down and what does it do? It devours them. It burns as long as their fuel and when the fuel runs out, it stops. I'll prove that in a second. And then look at this, it says this is the second death. Most Christians don't even know there's a second death. They don't know what that means. Seventh-day Adventists do. See, you, I may go walk right out the door, thank you, folks, God bless you, and have a heart attack and die. That's the first death. The one that counts is the one when the lake of fire is poured out. Those who do not qualify for heaven will experience the second death, which is eternal separation in the grave from God forever so that they won't be miserable on this earth with Jesus as the king. Thanatos, Thanatos, death. This is, this is right out of the, the Greek dictionary. This is what it says. Thanatos, death, literally, figuratively. <laughs> it doesn't go on to say other things because we know what death is. Folks, this is a second death. Second death wouldn't take place if you're kept alive for eternity and tortured. But the truth of the matter is we have to understand that the three angels' message has to be given not to f frighten everyone, but so they'll understand what's happening. And so it then says, and the smoke of their torment ascends up forever and ever. Look what Genesis nineteen twenty-eight says, and he, Abraham, looked towards Sodom and Gomorrah and towards all the lands of the plain, and behold, and lo, the smoke of the country went up as the smoke of a furnace. What is that in reference to? What fire? Sodom and Gomorrah. Yeah. It says he saw the smoke. Is Sodom and Gomorrah burning today? So the smoke may go up forever and ever, but not Sodom and Gomorrah. It's gone. Don't be fooled by these phrases that people have taken and twisted and come to wrong conclusions. Folks, this is the wine of Babylon. Our God isn't like that. In fact, I want to show you something else. In the, in the meetings we just had, um, Pastor Thomas was preaching, and he, and he used this text. Has anybody ever heard this text before? For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You can watch the football games. Actually, that's not true anymore. I've noticed that the camera people have quick, quit panning where they have John 3, 16. Do you remember not long ago? 
all the stadiums, someone would be behind the goalpost with John 3.16? Have you noticed that you don't see that so much anymore? I don't see it. Well, I shouldn't say that. I don't watch that much anymore. <laughs> and I never saw this until Thomas was preaching just last week or the week before. Folks, they sh believe in him should not perish. The Greek word for perish is apolumi, apolumi, to destroy fully, literal and physical, destroy, die, perish. That's the definition from the Greek dictionary. And right there in John 3, 16, it tells us they are not tormented forever and ever. They perish in the lake of fire. And God clearly showed us that the lake of fire exists to prove that they would not even repent after a thousand years of death. And so the truth is an everlasting fire is one that burns until it goes out. The results are everlasting, not the duration. Take a look at just, and by the way, I'm not doing this justice, folks. From Genesis to Revelation are text after text after text that verify all this. Look at Ezekiel. Ezekiel 28 is talking about Lucifer who turned Satan. Look what it says in there. All who knew you among the peoples are astonished at you. You have become a horror, a horror and shall be no more. Now, wait a minute. If, if Satan isn't going to be any more, then he's not in control of anything. And then check out Malachi 4.3. 3. You shall trample the wicked. It's talking about us. This is the last chapter of Malachi, talking about after the second coming of Jesus Christ. You shall trample the wicked, for they shall be... What? ashes under the soles of, the, of your feet on the day that I do this, says the Lord. Now, really quickly, just for the fun of it, you can never say I didn't have you turn to some text. Look at Psalms 37. Psalms 37, everyone. Just children. Psalms 37. Get your Bibles. I want to show you three texts. And by the way, I'm almost done now. Psalms 37. This is one isolated uh, psalm. Just, I picked this one. All right, let's start at verse, you got it, Psalms 37? Verse 20. Look what it says. But the wicked shall... Perish. There's that word perish again. It means to, to be destroyed or consumed. And the enemies of the Lord, like the splendor of the metals, shall vanish. Into smoke they shall vanish away. Gone. Disappeared. Take a look at verse 28. For the Lord loves justice and does not forsake his saints. They are preserved for what? Forever. forever. They're preserved forever. But the descendants of the wicked shall be cut off. And by the way, I checked that cut off. It's used a number of times in the Old Testament. In fact, it says that in the Day of Atonement, if anybody didn't come and humble themselves at the sanctuary, they were cut off from the congregation. You look it up in the Hebrew Dictionary, and it means that they are destroyed or consumed. That's what it means. And then finally, look at verse 38 of the same chapter, 38. But the transgression... Well, I'm going to read 37. Mark the blameless man and observe the upright, for the future of that man is peace. peace. Remember that. 
It's peace. And then it says, but the transgressors shall be destroyed together, the lake of fire. The future of the wicked shall be, same word, cut off. Would it, somebody have a different, what, instead of cut off? Anybody have a different version? Say something different. Means they'll be destroyed or consumed. All right. So we take a, a look at Malachi. Now we're going to look at Jude. This one's incredible to me. Jude is in the New Testament, and it says in Jude, as Sodom and Gomorrah, the cities around and the cities around, are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. And of course, we already asked the question, you know the answer, is it still burning today? No, it isn't. So eternal fire means a fire that completely consumes the fuel. That's what happens to the wicked. God mercifully puts them out of their misery. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angel in the presence of the Lamb. Now, the significance of this passage of Scripture in verse 10 escapes me, but one detail I picked up, and that is this. This tells me that the Lamb and the angels certify what's being done is correct, is just, is just, is right, because God is right there overseeing this act. And the Bible calls it a strange act. That God does this is a strange act because he's not willing that any should perish, but that all come to repentance. And so, no rest day or night. And the smoke of their torment ascends up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night that worship the beast and his image and whoever receives the mark in his name. Folks, let's not worship the beast and his image because you'll get no rest. In Revelation, in, in Matthew 11, it says what? Come unto me. All ye that labor and are heaven, heavy laden, and I will give you what? I will give you rest. I lost my page. All right, I'll just have to get closer. Hebrews 4.9 says, there, oh, there remains therefore a rest for the people of God. And in my commentary, in my... Um, Bible, it says rest or keeping a, um, it says a Sabbath, the Sabbath. It comes from the word sabbatismos, which means sabbatist or figuratively the repose of Christianity, rest. But sabbatismos comes from sabbaton, and the, it's a Hebrew origin, and it stands for the? Sabbath. They have no rest day or night because they did not keep the Sabbath. The commandments of God, folks, look at how all this fits together like a glove. The rest go for those who fear God, give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made everything and rested on the Sabbath day. The other day is the wine of Babylon, and that's just one of many examples of false doctrine that is pervading our Christian church and polluting our people, and they have no rest day or night. And so look what the three angels' messages end with. It ends with, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that do what? They keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. By the way, for those of you who have newer versions, 
I was shocked to find out that many of them say the faith in Jesus. Faith in Jesus is wrong. It's a genitive. Genitive is possessive. So the right word is of. We do not have faith in Jesus. He gives us faith in Jesus. It's his faith, not ours. If it was our faith, guess what? We're working our way to heaven. And so there it is. Our great God is warning us. He wants us to know what's going to transpire so we can be ready. And folks, I, you know, I want to do this. I want to be ready. When we're done here, you can say to me, Pastor, do you, do you feel ready? And I'll tell you, no. But Pastor, do you want to be ready? Yes. I want to overcome my shortcomings. I can only do that by beholding Christ every single day. And the three angels' messages turn our attention to Jesus because we clearly see the issues before us, the unholy trinity. Folks, you realize they have all the resources? We should borrow some money from them for our budget. <laughs> but we've got the message that God has endowed to this church, not as a privilege, but as an opportunity to reach out to other people. So they will not be part of the lake of fire, so we won't be part. In fact, in closing, I'll just say this. Those that reach out to people in an in appropriate fashion will be ready for the second coming because you're doing what God would have done if he were here, Amen. getting people ready. And so, my friend, I hope you would ponder these thoughts. I've got the notes here. If you want any text, pray over it, but make a decision. We've got a work to do. God calls this church to do it. He's called others, but others have said no. But I don't want to say no, and I hope you don't either. Father, as we part, I pray for a blessing upon each person who's come today. I pray that you will help us make a decision before we leave and that we can walk more closely to you and help other people to do the same. So dismiss us with your presence and thank you in Jesus' name, amen.